Frid och shalom vänner och idag är det den 31 januari. Jag tycker vi börjar med ett klipp där en förintelse överlevande. Han måste ju vara över hundra år den här farbron. Denne underbara man han ber för sitt barnbarn som ska åka ut i striden. Och lejer det här är väldigt starkt. Det kommer här. Sen måste vi ju ta med den här bilden då som vi hittade när det var en manifestation för Israel. Och jag tror det är från Stockholm på minnesdagen det här. Vi hade ju en i Göteborg också den 30 december. Allt sånt här ska framhävas. Det är underbart. Tack och lov. Mera folk till landets försvar. Judarnas försvar. Ja, det ska komma en tid. En väldigt svår tid över världen. När det kommer att handla om Folkens planer, satans planer och så Guds planer då. Och då gäller det ju att veta vilken väg man ska välja av de här. Det står ju att satan ska ju bedra hela jorden. Så det kommer alltså att se ut som det finns två vägar då. De förståndiga ska då lysa som himlavalvets ljus när Jesus har kommit tillbaka alltså. Och de som har fört många till rättfärdighet på rättfärdighetens väg. Som stjärnor alltså, alltid och för evigt. Och så säger Gud till Daniel, men du Daniel, göm dessa ord. Alltså planen, profetian alltså, om ändens tid. Försegla den skriften till ändens tid. Många kommer att forska i den och kunskapen ska bli stor. När jag och Daniel såg upp och fick se två andra där, en på flodens ena strand- och en på den andra stranden. En av dem sa till mannen som var klädd i linnekläder och som stod ovanför flodens vatten. Hur länge dröjer det innan änden kommer med dessa märkliga saker? Då vet vi att det handlar alltså om ändens tid. Och den tiden Jesus talar om i Matteus 24 och i uppenbarelseboken då givetvis. 12 och 7. Jag lyssnade till mannen som var klädd i linnekläder som stod ovanför flodens vatten. Och han lyfte sin högra och sin vänstra hand upp mot himlen och svor vid honom som lever för evigt. Att efter en tid, tider och en halv tid, när det heliga folkets makt är krossad, då ska allt vara fullbordat. Och eftersom tiden inte var inne för Daniel att förstå det här då, så säger Daniel också så här. Jag hörde det här, men jag förstod det inte. Så jag frågade, min herre, vad blir då slutet på detta? Han var nyfiken, är klart. Då sa han, gå Daniel, de här orden är förseglade och gömda. Men, då förstår vi, de ska alltså uppenbaras på ändens tid. Jag tror att det här handlar om uppenbarelseboken. Det är så mycket som stämmer i Daniels bok som, som uppenbarelseboken talar om. Och det är många som säger att du kan inte förstå uppenbarelseboken om du inte förstår Daniels boken, vad som står där. Många ska bli renade och tvagna och luttrade, men de ogudaktiga ska, de ska fortsätta bedriva sin ogudaktighet. Ingen ogudaktig ska förstå det här. Alltså vägarna, urskilja de här två vägarna. Men de förståndiga ska förstå det här. Och från den tid då det dagliga, står det, blir avskaffat och för ödesens styggelse uppställt ska det gå 1290 dagar. Salig är den som håller ut och hinner fram till 1335 dagar. Och hur många tror ni inte det är genom åren som har försökt att räkna allt det här? Men det står ju helt klart och tydligt att det här är, är, det tillhör de som lever på slutet av den här tidsåldern. 
Men gå du bort tills dess änden kommer. Sedan du har vilat ska du uppstå till din del. Vid tiderna slut. I vers 10 så står det här ord, hebreiska ordet bin då, som betyder urskiljning. Det betyder alltså att kunna välja mellan en väg och en annan väg. Och det är precis vad hela uppenbarhetsboken egentligen handlar om. Vi ser två vägar och vi ser två slutmål också. Titta vad gott med glass. Elvor kommer att bjöd på glass förstår ni. Vad glad jag blir. Men två dagar i rad nu så kommer vi ha en undervisning här med Mike Gendron. Nu kommer del ett. Och det handlar om urskiljning. Sedan kommer då efter det klippen som vanligt. Gud signa er så hörs vi under dagen på Telegram och hemsidorna. Amen. Your life when you recognized that you had been deceived. And how did you know that you were deceived? You were confronted with the truth, weren't you? Well, as Pastor Ryan said, I was a very devout Catholic for 35 years. I did not know I was living in deception. In fact, it wasn't until I opened the Word of God and I was confronted with the truth of God's Word that I realized I was deceived. Deception can be a terrible thing. We know that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And he uses religious pride and religious indoctrination as two of his most powerful tools to blind those from the glory of the gospel. And so more than ever, I think, in this time of great deception, we all need to be practicing discernment. And I have two objectives this morning. I'd like to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and his word as our supreme authority in knowing truth from error. And the second objective is that we would all have a greater desire to practice discernment, not only for ourselves, but also for those who are being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. So if you have your Bibles, open to 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we will launch this message with Paul's warning in verse 1. The Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And look at verse 2. We see deceitful spirits will use hypocritical liars to draw people away from the truth. In these last days, doctrines of demons and the demonic influences will be so convincing that some will depart from the apostolic faith into apostasy. Tragically, these apostates are professing Christians who knew the truth but were never born again. They had head knowledge, but it never reached their heart. They are like the seed that fell on rocky ground but had no root, no spiritual life, no real union with God. And Jesus talked about these in Matthew 13, verse 21. He said he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, he immediately falls away. Well, there are many false converts in our churches today who have never, ever been born again. They are in danger of being seduced and taken away by demonic spirits. More than ever, we need to have discernment to contend earnestly for the faith because false teachers are everywhere leading people down the wide road to destruction. In our 33 years of ministry, primarily equipping the body of Christ to be effective witnesses to 1.3 billion Roman Catholics, we have seen a growing number of professing Christians departing from the faith to join the apostate religion of Roman Catholicism. In fact, four out of, time, four out of five times when a Protestant marries a Roman Catholic, it is the Protestant that departs from the faith to join the Roman Catholic religion. Protestants who are told to stand firmly on the truth of God's word, they're the first ones to compromise. Catholicism, which stands on a lie, will never compromise. And that's why four out of five Protestants end up compromising to join the Catholic religion. 
So often I hear from parents who say, our child was raised in a Christian home and they went away to the university or whatever and they were deceived and led astray and now they totally deny the faith. Well, I think very few parents consider the consequences of not warning their children of false teachers and false religions. We have to do that more than ever because of the times in which we live. There are liars and deceivers everywhere. Government, big pharma, and the media are misinforming and misleading people by twisting and distorting the truth. Their lies produce only temporal consequences. However, when religious leaders mislead people, their lies have eternal consequences. And people can be misled and deceived about a lot of things in this life and still survive. But if they are deceived about life's most critical issue, and that is what must I do to become right with God? What must I do to be forgiven of my sins? If they die in that state, they will spend eternity in the fires of hell. Have you noticed how many people have lost their confidence in the ability to discern truth from lies? And there's a reason for that. It's because truth is being twisted, manipulated, and suppressed by hypocritical liars with their self-serving agendas. People are witnessing how easily truth can be twisted, manipulated, and suppressed. Our debased culture is redefining truth and reality. No one knows who to trust or how to avoid being misled or deceived. Our postmodern world has declared that there is no such thing as absolute truth because they say truth is now relative. Your truth is just as valid as mine. Well, the only way we can be part of the solution is to fight the good fight of faith against worldly corruption and worldly deception. So some of the questions we will answer this morning what is discernment and why do we need it? How and when are we to make judgments? How is Satan attacking the Christian faith today? Why does the good shepherd allow wolves near his flock? Have you ever considered that? We will look at answering that. What are the causes for the decline of discernment in our churches today? And what can you and I do to keep it alive? I think we would all agree that the professing church is experiencing its greatest crisis since the Dark Ages. The church is no longer the salt and light of the world. Instead, it has invited the world in, and it now looks very much like the world. Churches are not providing a steady diet of God's word. And as a result, biblical ignorance is everywhere, and it's producing fertile ground for deception. Since truth is not being taught from many pulpits, discernment is on the decline among professing Christians. And here you see a graph based on what's happened over the last 35, 36 years. We see that discernment is on the decline, deception and apostasy is on the increase. And tragically, as discernment is declining, the amount of deception in the church is increasing. Do we know what is causing the decline of discernment in our churches? It's directly related to the absence of sound doctrine being preached from the pulpit in many churches today. People are unable to discern truth from error because they're not getting a steady diet of God's word. And Paul warned us this would happen. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 to 4, he writes, The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth. Since people don't want sound doctrine, pastors are giving them feel-good messages that tickle their ears and appeal to the flesh and build up their self-esteem. Without sound doctrine, many in the church think it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you label it Christianity. Churches are filled with people who want their egos fed and their sins tolerated instead of their desire to become good through the faithful preaching of God's word. They want to feel good. Well, if the body of Christ does not start practicing discernment, 
very few will find the narrow road that leads to life. In fact, very few can even discern the, the difference between the wide road and the narrow road. So what is discernment? The Hebrew word ben and the Greek word diakrino are used hundreds of times in scripture to make distinctions to separate things at their points of difference. Without discernment, we cannot know God's way from man's way. We cannot know truth from error. We cannot know good from evil. Without discernment, we cannot discern between apostles and apostates or the true gospel from a compromised distortion of it. In our postmodern culture, the issue that once was seen as black and white has now been painted gray. That is why we need discernment. Things that are different can never be the same. So discernment and wisdom are linked together in Scripture. We see in Proverbs 10.13, on, on the lips of the discerning, wisdom is found. And in Proverbs 16, verse 21, the wise in heart will be called discerning. And yes, that is why wise men still seek after the Lord Jesus. The opposite is true as well. Those who are not wise will not seek to know Jesus as he is gloriously revealed in Scripture. Wisdom gained from the knowledge of God's Word, along with careful evaluation and accurate interpretation, are the skills that we need to exercise discernment. So let's look then at five reasons why we need discernment. The first one is of utmost importance, and that is to examine ourselves to make sure we're in the faith. This is the exhortation the Apostle Paul gives to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 13.5. I don't know about you, but I can't think of anything more terrifying than for a false convert to stand before the Lord Jesus at the, on the last day and to hear those troubling words, depart from me, I never knew you. They called him Lord, but they were boasting in what they were doing in his name rather than trusting him for what he had done. We see this in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Jesus said there would be many, not a few, on the last day that would call him Lord, and he would have to say, those terrifying words. That's because there are so many false gospels being preached today. And that's one of the reasons why we produced a gospel track entitled True Faith or False Hope. How can I be sure? It's based on Paul's exhortation that professing Christians need to examine themselves to make sure they have believed the purity and the exclusivity of God's gospel. The second reason we need to have discernment is to know and prove what the will of God is. And we see that in Romans 12:2, where Paul writes, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And the third reason we need discernment is te to test the veracity of every man's teaching. And we see this so clearly given in Acts 17, 11, when Paul is preaching in the synagogues of Berea. As he is preaching, he notices that his listeners are searching the scriptures to test the veracity of an apostle's teaching. Paul didn't get upset. He commended them. This is a good principle to follow. We must test every man's teaching. If an apostle was under judgment by the scriptures. That means every teacher should come under the same judgment. There's a good principle for all of us. We must learn to look to the scriptures before we leap to accept what a man has taught. We need to know the word well enough to discern the teachings of men. We must test everything by the supreme authority of God's word. Another way to say it is we must test the uninspired words of men with the inspired word of God. That must be consistent in our lives. The fourth reason we need discernment 
is to identify and to expose preachers who are servants of the devil, carrying out his goal to deceive the whole world. Paul writes about this in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15. Listen to how many times he uses the word disguise. Paul wrote, such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Jesus commended the church at Ephesus, saying, You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. Revelation 2, verse 2. Well, we live in a very deceptive age, you know that. Most false teachers do not outright deny the gospel. What they do is twist and distort it and compromise it. And this is the strategy of Satan. His agents use the language of religion to mask and hide poison so that gullible people will receive it and be led astray. Whenever you and I as born-again Christians fail to expose and reprove the lies of the devil, his doctrines of demons go unabated. I'm so thankful for Pastor Ryan for reading the epistle of Jude this morning. It really frames this issue so well. We must earnestly contend for the faith. And the fifth reason why we need discernment, to examine everything carefully so that we can hold fast to that which is good and abstain from every form of evil. The Greek word for examine means to test or to judge something to see if it is genuine. Then, once we have tested it to be genuine, we're to hold fast, which means to embrace it, to take possession of what is genuine and good. But we need discernment to judge what is good and what is evil. Well, the most frequently quoted verse in all of Scripture is Matthew 7, 1. What about judge not so that you will not be judged? How do we respond to that? It is the most quoted verse. Well, it was, if you look at the context, it only forbids hypocritical judgments. We are to make righteous judgments. In fact, in John 7, 24, John quotes the Lord Jesus do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Have you ever noticed how many times in Scripture we are called to make judgments? Let me share with you just a few. We are to judge righteously, as we've just seen. We are to judge all things, 1 Corinthians 2.15. We are to judge the preaching of pastors, 1 Corinthians 14, verses 20, verse 29. Judge the words of a pastor to see if they line up with Scripture. We are to judge false spirits. 1 John 4, 1 tells us to test every spirit to see if they're from God. We are to judge false teachers, as we've seen in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 to 4. We're to judge false prophets. Matthew 7, verses 15 to 20. Jesus said you will know them by their fruit. We are to judge false apostles, as we see in Revelation 2.2. 2. We're to judge false Christians. John says they went out from us because they were never part of us. Had they been part of us, they would have remained with us. We're to judge evil deeds of darkness and to expose them, Ephesians 5.11. We're to judge sin within the church, 1 Corinthians 5.12. And we are to judge matters between the brethren, 1 Corinthians 6, 5. When we hear messages and read books and surf the internet, we must be ready to make judgments. We must be asking key questions. What doctrinal truth is being denied? What doctrinal truth is being rejected or ignored? What doctrinal truth is being twisted or distorted? We must make judgments. So why do we need to practice discernment? 
because fatal errors are often hidden beneath a thin veneer of truth. This is why so many people see Roman Catholicism as a valid expression of Christianity. They share some of the fundamental truths of the Christian faith, but that is but a thin veneer of truth that hides a false and fatal gospel. The father of lies deceives the world with subtle half-truths. We must warn others who are deceived and do not know it. In Matthew 24, Jesus said the last days would be marked by great deception with an abundance of false teachers, false prophets, and false Christ who will deceive even the elect if possible. We need to practice discernment not only for ourselves, but also for others who are being deceived with doctrines of demons. Paul gives us an important warning, Colossians 2.8. He writes, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of this world, rather than according to Christ. Remember the very nature of deception is that people do not know they're deceived until they are confronted with the truth. You and I are truth bearers. If we see someone deceived, we must lovingly confront them. That is the only way they will ever know that they've been deceived. But unfortunately, most Christians are reluctant to warn others because it's not popular to expose error and to expose heresy. But warn we must because we're given an imperative in Titus chapter 1, verse 9. Listen to Paul. Exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. That's how we must live our Christian life. Well, A.W. Tozer gave a great example of how the body stays alive. And of course, the parallel here is the body of Christ. He says white cells are like discernment. They identify and pounce upon toxic matter, then carry it out of the body. They remove all poisonous matter in order to keep the body healthy. Red cells are like faith. They carry life-giving oxygen to every part of the body. So I think this is a great and powerful example of how the body of Christ must work. Each member is a white blood cell and must identify doctrinal error so that it can be removed from the church. If doctrinal error and habitual sin is not identified and, and removed, it will continue to circulate and threaten the very life of the church. We must keep discernment alive if the body of Christ is to remain strong and healthy. And if we are to be victorious in spiritual warfare, we must know how the adversary operates in the church. And the Bible has much to say about that. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, Peter writes, There will be false teachers among you. Paul writes to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, verse 30, From your own selves men will arise speaking perverse things in order to draw away disciples after them. Paul also writes in 2 Corinthians 11, 4, some will come and preach another Jesus and another gospel, and it will be motivated by another spirit. False teachers who deceive people about their eternal destiny are to be exposed as enemies of God and agent, agents of the devil. Make no mistake, they are enemies of God and agents of the devil. Those who distort or pervert the gospel of grace are propagating the most lethal and deadly lie anyone could ever speak. Satan's agents deceive people with a false Christ, which always leads to a false gospel. You see, if you're not proclaiming Christ in all of his sufficiency, it leads to another gospel instructing you what you must do in order to obtain eternal life. Anything that opposes or contradicts the word of God must be called doctrines of demons. And remember what Paul wrote in Ephesians 6, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, 
but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And John tells us in 1 John 5, 19, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. I don't think we grasp that very often. And that's why the world is spinning out of control. That's why there's so many unbelievers marching proudly down the wide road to destruction. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Doctrines of demons lead people into all kinds of error. They seduce, they entice, they deceive, and they are most powerful. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. God is sovereign over all things, but he allows Satan to operate under his sovereignty. I want you to look at the first doctrine of demons, and I'm going to take you all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Satan's first lie was telling Eve, you surely shall not die if you break God's command. Did you know that this doctrine of demons is perpetuated by the Roman Catholic Church? It has what is called a doctrine of venial sins. Venial sins, according to the Catholic Church, do not cause death, only temporary punishment. But yet Scripture declares that all sins are mortal. Ezekiel 18.4, the soul that sins will surely die. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. So if you're not aware of Roman Catholic theology, they have two categories of sin. You see the venial sins here that do not cause death, but then they have mortal sins, such as murder or adultery or even missing church on Sunday. They're the ones that cause death. So the Roman Catholic Church promotes Satan's first lie in the garden with their doctrine of venial sins. I call it the trilogy of Catholic deception because based on that first doctrine of demons that was exposed in the garden, venial sins, according to the Catholic Church, do not cause death. And so the Catholic Church recognized, well, what happens to people that die in venial sin? We need to create a place for them to go. And so they created a place called purgatory where they say sins are purified in the fires. But now that they have all these Catholics suffering in purgatory with venial sins, now they need a way to get them out. So they created another lie called indulgences. And this is where punishment is reduced. This is why the Catholic Church has become one of the richest institutions on the face of the earth, selling God's forgiveness through indulgences. And if you know your church history, you know that was one of the sparks of the Reformation. You can see how the fatal lie of the devil in the garden has morphed into these additional lies. Syndens last mit sinne tyngde ned Ofta Jesus på mitt hjärta klappat har Jag bjudit mig sin frälsnings djupa fri Var jag tyngd av sorger då min Jesus sa det så Kom till mig och du ska leva i frid och glädje få Och i tro till honom tog jag mot hans bud Och nu lever jag Världen säga var det min För jag har fått Guds himmel här på jord Halleluja, för det är allra bäst 
Jag av nåd fick komma sådan som jag var Ja, alla mina synder Jesus åt till korset var Och min gamla synd har direkt han tagit av Jag kastat den i glömskans hav Oh, oh. 